is up booktube it is monty and today i'm back again once again with another video and i'm doing this a little bit differently because part of me wishes that i had vlogged this part of me but the other part of me knows that um i wouldn't have liked that and so today i'm gonna sit down do my skincare routine in front of my nice camera we're gonna have a nice soft discussion about Sarah J Mass, about House of Sky and Breath, how Sarah played in my face for 2,000 pages. I say 2,000 because I'm going to include the page count of fucking um, House of Earth and Blood. And I know that it's really closer to 1,500, but fucking 2,000. So just to get the non-spoilery bits out of the way, House of Sky and Breath picks up mm, a little bit after, I think it's like a couple of months after the events of House of Earth and Blood. So, you know, everyone is dealing with the ramifications of everything that, that went down over there with, you know, Bryce's little closed circuit television display of power, connecting to the gates, killing an archangel vacuuming them up the death of lahaba all of that bullshit is you know behind us danica and them been dead almost three years that's gonna be important and they're at the you know the little opera house the prologue we see we see the human rebel forces um ostensibly this book is a missing persons case the first book as you'll recall was a murder mystery <coughs> and so for book two to be a missing persons case I feel like Sarah has had a lot of time to sit at home watch some law and order maybe some criminal minds and she's like you know what I want to write I, I want to write like a high fantasy urban fantasy procedural because Hunt is a cop let us not forget that man is a cop he is a police officer and so she's like that's what I want to do I want to write my urban fantasy police procedural but i didn't really want to follow the police and so we follow bryce and i have to say that i don't understand why bryce is the main character because in this book she does quite little the book is told from varying perspectives we get bryce's point of view we get hunt's point of view we get Therian. Therian is so important that in the Target edition that you see behind me that is going back to Target because the U.S. editions and the international U.K. edition that I have of the first book, the spines don't match. They look really ugly sitting next to each other. So I ordered a copy from Blackwell's and that'll be here soon. But Therian, the little spy master for the River Queen, is so important that not only does he get a perspective in the book, but if you go to Target and you pick up the Target edition, he has a special bonus scene. Did I read that special bonus scene? No, because quite frankly, I don't care. I don't care what that man has to say. I don't care what he was off page doing during the events of House of Sky and Breath because that man should have been doing them during the events of House of Sky and Breath because all of his chapters are the same. He's going to the River Queen, He's updating the River Queen. He's complaining about having to work for the River Queen. Talking about how he would much rather be above and not beneath. And how he has to run to the water. He has to run to the water so he doesn't, you know, permanently stay a human and not a mer person. But he wants, he wants, he wants to be free of the River Queen. Let us not forget. Now that that's all out of the way, we can talk about Miss Sophie and how she is the center of this whole book. And us searching for Sophie and Emile is the center of this whole book. And yet, very little of the book actually details the search for these characters. Like, <laughs> the the way that Sarah J. Mass wanted us to feel that these characters were going to be so important and then did absolutely nothing <laughs> to find them is a little, um, how do you say, shocking? Uh, I thought it was shocking that we literally did nothing with them we literally did nothing to find them we were literally just it was all vibes and in the search for this super important character that was very clearly dead like <laughs> very clearly dead it was also a very interesting choice to have the 
the actual plot of the book be propelled by grief in the second book. And I, here's the thing about grief. I do believe that grief is a an, an odd thing. Either way, the first book was propelled by... The first book was allegedly propelled by Bryce's grief. When I read that first book uh, over the course of five days on the reading live sprints that I held, I was bored the entire time. And then after I finished it and I did a little live show with other creators, I think it was with Mayana and Chandler and Mina from Mina Reads. I think it was... There might have been some other people on that live. I don't remember. But on that live and even in subsequent discussions of the book, everyone talks about how grief is like a really powerful aspect of that book and how they really felt that Sarah J. Mass was able to depict Bryce grieving her friend um, in like a really interesting way. And I just didn't see it there. I thought that it was foolishness how uh, Danica had died and Bryce was content to live her. I mean, she wasn't content. She did talk about how like she was like suffering, um, how she had like this scar that she didn't want to get rid of because it was Danica and how the, the scar hurt her sometimes, but it was okay because it was for Danica. Like there were like small elements that were like for Danica and like that was her grieving. Um, but in the second book, Danica and the pack of wolves or the, the den of wolves or whatever the fuck their little ragtag raggedy name was continue to have like this really outsized presence in the narrative not only do we find out more things about Danica's past and Danica's character I do agree with Aaron where it's like every five seconds our our girl Bryce Quinlan was out here talking to like oh Danica would never the Danica I know but it's kind of like bitch did you know Danica like were y'all friends like y'all had matching tattoos y'all were like going out to the club every night y'all lived together sis left you this fancy new apartment all this bullshit Danica had a whole separate life in the first book from you and yet when that life continues to be exposed and unraveled Bryce continued to be like yeah, Danica would never, what do you mean? My, my preconceived notions of Danica are all like being thrown into the wind. And it's like, bitch, that should have happened the moment you found out that she ground down a priceless artifact and had it tattooed onto your skin. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just me. But the minute I find out that my friend actually, you know, not only stole this magical, powerful object, was playing on my face telling me that they were on the hunt for it, that they were going to try and collect the bounty for it, and were helping me look for this, and the whole time the shit's been tattooed on my back. You're not going to catch me caping for them. Like, we can still be friends, I can still be the homie, but you're not going to catch me being like, I knew them so well. It'll be like, yeah, bitch, I thought I knew them, but XYZ happened, and I don't know no more. But I also thought that it was really lazy for all of the really big <laughs> plot twists of the book were related to Danica and things that we didn't know about Danica and what Danica had discovered and the things that Danica had discovered leading to her being killed. And it's just kind of like we already went down this path and what she is giving me now makes no sense. I also had an, I how do I talk about this? I did not like the use of the human rebels in this book. Um, I did like how they were very clearly willing to backstab the veneer. I did appreciate that. I did think that was a a character trait of them, of, of the situation, that I found to be both believable and a little bit exciting, dare I say. Like, I thought that that was a very good choice to have that happen. But at the same time, some of the way that, like... <laughs> Bryce was going around talking to them I thought was a little bit unnecessary like when they were at I forget where they were at they were doing something with the rebels and Bryce showed up and she was like y'all are just ugly like <laughs> y'all are <laughs> y'all are garbage um so yes I was getting my nails done but actually I'm here to help you little uglies out now and it was just like bitch like what like, it was weird. It was a very weird to see them, like, dismiss them. And, like, yes, the Rebels are, like, a terrorist organization or whatever, but at the same time, like, the Veneer are actually usually horrible to these people. And so for the humans to, like, fight back against these magically gifted people, 
was fine for me. Hunt's reticence to join and, like, help the humans was, like, sure, fine. But, like, basically, the human rebellion turned into, like, this whole, like, red herring of a plot. And I was just, like, this whole thing was a, a red herring. Like, the whole, the whole thing. Like, Sarah just, like, waved her hand and was like, yeah. Um, I know that my characters are, like, oppressing humans and, like, talking down on them and we're doing this whole other plot line where Captain Save a Ho, the fraternity edition, is like trying to free the slaves that are like magical. But like these human bitches, like they're just raggedy. But we're gonna go back over here to Captain Save a Ho Fraternity Edition and they're gonna save magic it was just weird it was we it was a weird choice it was also a weird choice how i didn't like this romance i don't like hunt um i've never liked mr orion altavar whatever his last name is i hate i hate hunt okay i don't believe that man washes his ass i don't believe it um uh, i don't like <laughs> I, I do think that it was very strange how there was not a single sex scene where he didn't turn into, like, a human lightning or uh, an angel lightning, uh, be, like, bolt. It was weird how, like, he couldn't seem to pull his dick out without also crackling lightning all around his body. Like, sir, what are you? Every time he pulled his dick out, so came the electricity. And I was just like, that's not sexy. Like... <laughs> I didn't think that it was sexy. Uh, I didn't think it was sexy at all. I also didn't think it was sexy how the romance continued to be slow burn. It's like, why would you have this? I mean, on one hand, I thought it was really cute how they wanted to have, like, this little agreement not to fuck until the winter solstice. But I was like, Sarah, you you already gave us the slow burn. Like, you already gave us the slow burn. And then what she gave us in this one wasn't even slow burn. It was just like, y'all just could fuck. Like, y'all could just fucking get it over with. Because you want to fuck. You clearly want to be with each other. And they wanted to be to the point that it was actively hindering the plot. So, in this book, we get introduced to a character named Cormac, who is the prince of the Avalon Fae, who, like, live on this island, shrouded in the mist, and they're, like, connected to the old ways, I guess. I don't really know. I don't really understand what's going on over there. But, um, Cormac's daddy and... Bryce's daddy have arranged for these two to get married and unite the Valbrun Fae and the Avalon Fae, and they're just, like, gonna unite the little Fae kingdoms or whatever. Um, and so part of the plot of the book is supposed to be <laughs> Bryce and Cormac pretending to be engaged as they search for the missing girl, Sophie. And yet, everybody and their mother knows that Hunt and Bryce are fucking. Like, Bryce and Hunt talk about how they need to, like, pretend, and they have to do this, and they have to do that, and, like, there's a lot of lip service paid to them pretending to not really be fucking, but that entire time, they're fucking, that entire time, they're seen in public together, clearly engaged in a romantic situation ship, so it was kind of like, and to the point where Hunt's boss knew, like, Hunt's boss was like, yeah, you two are fucking, I can smell it, like, I can smell her cunt on you, and I was just like, this is weird, Y'all are weird. And it was kind of to the point where if everybody's supposed to believe that Bryce and Cormac are together and the governor of the little situation ship can see that y'all two are fucking, like, is is Cormac just getting cucked? Like, I know it was for plot purposes, but, like, could you have at least attempted? Like, were attempts made? And the answer is no. Attempts were not made. But also, in the Battle of the Alpha Holes, I liked Cormac more. One, because I believe that Cormac washes his ass. So I believe that he is a, a clean individual. Was he an alpha hole? Yes. That man has severe, internalized. <laughs> he was like the epitome of the patriarchy and everything that is wrong with mankind, or fey kind, I guess. But it worked. I said, if you're going to give me an alpha hole, give me one that is him. Like, Hunt's little bitch ass, he needed to go somewhere. One, to learn how to properly bathe. And two, to, like, 
I don't know, just get away from me. Like, <laughs> I didn't care that he had, like, matured over the course of the story. I didn't care that, like, his character was the only one that seemed to be, like, attempting to think things through and be the voice of reason and be like, this is stupid, but I, if we're going to do this, then, like, we should be safe about it. Like, he was the only one that was doing that. And so, points to him. But I also would have just removed his chapters entirely from the book because I think he was fine just showing up in Bryce's perspective. I don't think any of the scenes that we got of just him were necessary because most of the time he was thinking about Bryce's cunt and how he wanted to eat her out again. That's what he added to the story. So if we got rid of Therian and we got rid of Hunt's perspectives, I think the book would have been a little bit shorter, would have been a little bit tighter. As for the other character perspectives we get in this book, we get Ethan, the younger brother of Connor, who died in the first book, who was also, he was like romanticized in this book, and I was getting creeper vibes from him in House of Earth and Blood. Like, he was out here claiming Bryce, talking about how they were going to be mates, and how he had like never, he was like a dog with a fucking bone. And it was weird, because Bryce had been like, no fam, like, we're just friends. I think they had like maybe hooked up and she like kind of flirted with him but it was very clear to the reader that she was not going for connor and when she was about to be like sure we can go on that date i guess it was very much like you have worn me down and so like one when people like connor i'm just like why and two everybody was like very like they fell into that propaganda that fucking sabine was out here running all through lenathian i guess i guess that's the only explanation that i have so when Ethan showed up, I was like, Ethan, it makes sense for him to like mourn Connor, I guess, even though I did wish he had another storyline. And when Ethan finally moved in the frat house that Rune was running, I was thinking we were going to get like a gangbang situation with um, Ethan and Flynn and Declan and maybe Rune. Rune could join in for some spicy dicey times, I guess. But um, that didn't happen. But I, I do think that Rune, Ethan, Declan, Flynn all over there in that little frat house. I did think that was the strongest part of the narrative. I think I just like that little cohort. I like their little group. I do think that, like, Rune, Flynn, and Declan are just, like, <laughs> the bargain bin version of Reese, Cassian, and Azriel. But in the little Reese trio, I only care about Cassian. And over here, I like Declan, Flynn, Rune, and I like Ethan, the little stray puppy that they brought into the Fey house. Like, I liked them. So in the battle of them, we could just replace the, the Reese trilogy with <laughs> a Rune. <laughs> and I think that it would just be a better, stronger situation. So shout out to them. Um, but the gangbang situation, spoiler alert, like I said, didn't happen, but I still eventually found myself liking Ethan, and I didn't mind that a lot of his chapters were just like, I miss my brother, I need to find out what happened to my brother, and it's kind of like, bitch, he's been dead for three years, like, <laughs> you can do something that's not for your brother, but it was very clear that, you know, Ethan couldn't, and Ethan, again, is younger than the rest of the cast because he was you know not by much but like a couple years so which is a lot when you consider that rune is pretty old because you know he he made the drop i think they're talking about how he's been the starborn prince for like two decades so rune is significantly older than some of the other characters um i also think it makes sense for hunt to be more mature because that man is centuries old so that's what it is Overall, like, the enjoyment that I had in this book was very two-star. I think that, that for me, the issues I had with Crescent City, um, the first book, House of Earth and Blood, and this one are the same. I ultimately do not think that this is a series that is for me, because I don't think that this feels like a series that Sarah J. Mass has planned out. But let's talk spoilers for a second. I also don't think that House of Sky and Breath works, because... I think that House of Sky and Breath was really just set up to give us this crossover. A crossover that I was really confident we were never going to get. Um, because it felt, I don't say it felt 
like an odd choice, but it does feel like a very odd choice because the the world that she was crafting for Crescent City seemed to be so well, well, I don't say well thought out, but she was definitely trying to give the girlies notes. She was like, yeah, I thought about that. And I thought about this and she was dropping, you know, explanations for everything left, right and center in House of Earth and Blood. And that's what really bloated that book. And so here we kept getting all of these little hints and tips and tricks that were definitely pointing towards like, we're going to cross over, we're going to cross over. But when I tell you that fucking, when Bryce fell through the fucking portal, I was like, what is happening? Because I had been spoiled. I knew that Resand was going to make an appearance, but I didn't like read the context of the spoiler because I was so mad that Resand was going to appear in this book that I thought Reese was going to come to the world of the fucking Crescent City world, you know, she was going to come to Midgard. But when Bryce fell through that portal into Prithian, I said, okay. Okay, um, <laughs> my interest is piqued. But at the same time, um, what? Like, <laughs> I also thought it was very, um... I was I was also very much side eyeing when we found I we might have found this out in the first book, but when uh in this one when they were going to the Asteri little palace or whatever and it was a crystal palace, I was like like the glass castle. The 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 glass castle that the Aelin destroyed that got blown up. I think actually Dorian destroyed the glass palace and like Kale was there. It was a group effort to destroy the glass palace. But um that like that glass palace like was that a reference did they see the Havillard mansion and they were like you know what you were on or something Mr. Havillard and they just like built their own version but <laughs> that aside when she when she fell through the portal and was in Prithian I was like okay this is a little bit more interesting because one it was very clear that she was not in fucking hell when she was seeing that there was like grass and mist or whatever although I wouldn't put it past fucking Sarah J Mass to put in grass in her version of hell but um Cassian and and Feyre and 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 cohort popping in in <laughs> at the end of this book I was like okay but I am also just very much like but what's what is the reason because not only do I have to wait for House of Earth and Blood or what is I think the next one is probably going to be mm, I feel like Flame and Shadow is like a really it's like a really punchy ending so if there's going to be four books I would assume that Flame and Shadow would be the last one. But if there's only going to be three, because um, I, I would not want the last book to be House of Many Waters. That's a, such a sad little book title. But um, I also do think that it was weird to give House of Sky and Breath a blue cover. Is there going to be two blue covers? Like, what are you going to do for Many Waters? So maybe, I think this might just be a three and done. And we're going to end with Flame and Shadow. But we also already have a red cover. So I guess the next one's going to be black. I don't know. Either way... <laughs> Either way, um, I just, I feel like that's interesting, but it also makes me wonder what's going to happen in the next Akatar book. Like, is Elaine about to get upstaged? Like, what is, ha like, for what? Like, questions get introduced to Miss, Miss Girl falling into the world of Prithian. That I'm just kind of like, this is, this is so sad. Like, this is so, mm. But I also think that, um... Even though I know my girl, my girl Aelin went through it in Kingdom of Ash, and Aelin might not be the benefit to the world that she might have been, um, if you were going to give me a war book, that's the bitch I want on my side. I know that Nesta and Cassian and, and Feyre and Reese and I guess Elaine was there, um, <laughs> they were all... They went to war against the High King, and then they, there's this like this other pseudo war brewing with their version of the human race, led by that little, hot like little queenie queen or whatever. But Aelin, she was a successful warrior. Okay, like Aelin, she did what she needed to do. She won her war, and I understand that she might not have everything she need. But if I was gonna go up against the Asteri, I would want them. I would want them. I would go on over there. I would get Aelin. I would get Kale. I would get Dorian. Manon can tag along. I would get Aelin's cousin, Aelin. I think that was his name, Aelin. He can come over. Lysandra. She can come over. Irene. She can do her little Healy Heel. 
Like those that's the world I would want to fall into. Reese, fuck him. Don't want Reese anywhere near me trying to trying to win anything. Not that garbage can of a of a fay. So I do think that it was interesting, but I also feel like it's also points to I I it almost feels more like a Bloomsbury decision than it does a Sarah decision. It feels very like why now? Why at this juncture? And what are these characters going to do that is going to benefit their larger story? I used to think that Crescent City was a perfect place to start because it was essentially a one and done if you just wanted a murder mystery because the thing that pushes you into the next book doesn't happen until the epilogue. Here, what pushes you into the next book happens in the epilogue a little bit, but also in the chapter before then when, you know, she goes into the portal. But... <sighs> For that to keep pushing you, for you to be intrigued in what that's going to mean for the next book, you have to have read a trilogy. Because I, I'm personally not invest, like I'm a little bit invested in that. I do think it's interesting that Bryce went there and they didn't come to her. But also, again, I'm only interested in that because I have that foundation in a trilogy that she wrote. And I know that a lot of people read that trilogy, but I also know that some people um, haven't. I know that up for some people, House of Earth and Blood was their first Sarah J. Mass book, and I know that came out two years ago. So in that time, they might have gone back and like read her backlist, but some people might not have because the other books are not urban fantasy. So if you were the urban fantasy girly and you read House of Earth and Blood because it's the urban fantasy, and now you have to go read this like raggedy, a uh, fucking Beauty and the Beast retelling. And then this raggedy little war that Sarah J. Mouse pulled out of her ass so you can read the urban fantasy one. I don't know if you'd want to. And I don't really know if I care about this, like, um, the idea that the, the Asteri have gone through these many worlds and have conquered all of them. And this is, like, their latest venture and they've been here for, like, 15,000 years don't know how invested I am in that narrative or in seeing that war play out or what that's going to mean going forward. But Sarah has a hold on my wallet because I will be purchasing. <laughs> I will be purchasing the next Akatar book. I will be purchasing the next Crescent City book. I don't have space on this shelf no more. Uh, this right here, well, you can kind of see Silver Flames right here. Uh, that shelf is officially full. So um, while it is my goal in 2022 to get rid of a lot of things from both of these shelves Sarah gonna have a place she, she gonna have a place on my on my little bookshelf um what that's going to mean going forward I don't know I don't know um would I recommend you read House of Sky and Breath maybe um if you're caught up if you've read everything that Sarah has already written I say go for it if you started with House of Earth and Blood um, I do think that it's more of the same, which is why I'm giving this the same rating that I gave the first book. I think that this is, it started off with the series that had the most potential because it was something new in a world that was new. And I think that it's quickly just become something that, yeah, this is just going to be whatever for me. The first book was a random setup. The second book is very clearly a second book in a Sarah J. Mass series. And book three is probably going to be a little lackluster conclusion. I think that's why I like the Throne Glass book so much is that yes, the first book is kind of, I feel like some people say the series goes in a completely different direction after Air of Fire, but I think it really happens in the first book. I think that Throne of Glass and then Crown of Midnight, like from Throne of Glass to Crown of Midnight is like kind of a big jump. But the things that happen in Crown of Midnight that carry on through the end of that series are like a really solid set, including Assassin's Blade. So all of the <laughs> the things that happen in the series, uh, I think you could see that Sarah had mapped out. And I think that book four, Queen of Shadows, is still one of the best, one of the best books that she's ever written. Definitely one of the, it might be Queen of Shadows might be objectively the best book that Sarah J. Mass has written. The best one. Like, it might be the best uh, arc. I also feel like that's another issue I have with House of uh, Sky and Breath is that you can see that there are plot threads, but the threads never coalesce into anything. They say, they stay just like threads, but I feel like in her other books, especially Throne of Glass, uh, those threads manifest into something within the book and within the larger context of the story that she's telling 
here i feel like we are just so close to the story like everything is like right here and all of the characters that we even though it is multi-perspective they are all working toward the same problem they are all trying to untangle the same ball of yarn that there's no larger perspective for us to have i also this is a little nitpicky thing but i am bothered that at the beginning of house of sky and breath it's the same raggedy map that we had from the first book which made sense in the first book because the events of the first book were confined to crescent city but in the second book we are going to all different kinds of locations and places that have nothing to do with lanathian and so it's like okay this is cute but I need, like, a larger context of this world. I'm not, like, a map girly, but I do think it would have been nice to, like, kind of see once and to maybe reference back. Because they were talking about so many different locations in this world that I have, like, no idea how long it was taking these people to get places. Not that it matters because they do have, like, modern technology, but Sarah does also do this thing where... At the end of one chapter, we're doing one thing, and then the next chapter starts off with two weeks later, one week later, sometime later. And I was just like, sis, please stop. Um, so ultimately, I did give this book two out of five stars. Like I said, I will be continuing. And whether or not you should pick this up and continue on is really going to be up to you. It's going to be up to the things that you know that you like. And again, I know that Monet really loved House of Earth and Blood and she gave this book one and a half stars, half a star, one and 1.5 stars. Like this was not the bag. It was not the moment, but she will also be continuing. So I do think that there is your mileage is going to vary, whether you're a person who thinks that Sarah can do no wrong or whether you're a person that is just bored by the Crescent City situation. And I find myself kind of just on the latter end. Like, I've read so many of her books. The only book I haven't read from her is Catwoman. And so it's just like, I've seen so many of these like repeated tropes and so many of these repeated like ideas that it's hard for me not to compare them against each other. Because when you're going to write in the same wheelhouse over and over and over again. Also, this is a side note, but at the end of the book, when she revealed that all of her new magical characters were really just fey, electric chair electric chair the fucking sapphics that we got in this book electric chair bitch we said we wanted danica and bryce and you gave us the raggedy uh fucking governor lady backstabbing and turning bitches in and the person that fucking uh rune is engaged to be betrothed to get the fuck out nobody asked for that bullshit so i'm gonna go <laughs> I'm gonna go. Hopefully editing Monty was able to edit this into something that was actually watchable. Fingers crossed for that. Um, and if you've read House of Sky and Breath, let me know down below if you're gonna continue on. And three, you can drop, uh, uh, well, I'm gonna steal Aaron. We're gonna drop a blue heart emoji down there in the comment section today. So thanks for watching. I'll see all of you guys again really soon. But until then, and until next time.